Welcome to the second talk of this morning session. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Hain. And he will talk about a guide to variations of mixed heart structure, generality, and examples. Okay, well, um, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. <laughs> and thank you for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I'm going to be semi-classical here. I'm going to use paper slides. So I'm going to switch over to a document camera. And there we go. Yeah. So I'm going to stick pretty much with what I suggested in the abstract, except I'm going to do different examples. I'm going to do examples connected with modular forms rather than the KZB connection. So um, here's an overview. I'm going to review the definition of a variation of mixed hard structure. I mean, I'm sure everybody here more or less knows what it is, but there's one important property that uh, is extremely strong and it's extremely useful, but it's a little bit technical. And so, and I need it. So I'm going to recall the definition of mixed hard, variation of mixed hard structure. I'm going to explain why you might care. I'm basing that on what I've seen in other talks and what I know that, say, um, Colleen and Philip and Mark Green are interested in understanding the sort of boundary of the period map for, say, hypersurfaces and PN. And then I'm going to explain tools for understanding variations. Again, some of this is old and not terribly well known. And then I'm going to do some examples, but like I said, I'm not going to do KZB, but I will do ex just some simple extensions associated with classical modular forms because they're quite instructive. So um, a variation of mixed hard structure. So we're going, the base is going to be a smooth variety. So at the moment, this is a smooth, say smooth projective variety going to be the complement of a divisor with normal crossings inside a, say, projective manifold. And so the first piece of data is a local system of finite dimensional rational vector spaces. It's endowed with a weight filtration. So it's defined over Q. And so these are going to be, it's a filtration by sublocal systems. V will denote the canonical extension of, uh, so Deline's canonical extension of the associated flat connection over X, but it extends to X bar, that's Deline's extension. And in the case where the local monodromy is unipotent, which I'll assume throughout for simplicity, um, well, the first observation is Deline's connection takes V into V tense of the log one forms. So it's a connection with regular singular points and it's characterized by the property that all the residues of the connection are nilpotent in the case when the local monodromy is unipotent. And so this is a very common occurrence in algebraic geometry. And if you're not in that situation, you can always get into that situation by a local base change. All right, so I'm going to assume that all the residues are nilpotent or equivalently that the monodromy is locally unipotent. So we also require a Hodge filtration of Deline's canonical extension, all right? So this is the extended bundle and um, the Hodge filtration is required to satisfy Griffith's transversality so that if you differentiate something in FP, you go in FP minus one. I actually also like to just think of, this is just FP. <laughs> Sorry, this is just FP, right? It's FP of um, V tensor omega one. So the connection preserves the Hodge filtration. And so what are the axioms? So the first one is obvious is that each fiber of the rational local system 
has a mixed Hodge structure uh, with the Hodge filtration cut out by the Hodge filtration of the corresponding flat vector bundle. And this is for each X in X. So the graded, the weight graded quotients of V with this Hodge filtration is a polarized variation of mixed Hodge structure, sorry, polarized variation of Hodge structure. Sometimes you can get away without having a polarization, but we'll assume it. And so <clears throat> the more subtle conditions are the conditions at infinity. So one way to say this is for each analytic arc through the divisor at infinity. So it just intersects the divisor in a point P. Um, so you can restrict you can restrict the variation to this guy here. In particular, you can restrict the connection. So to this disk, and you can take the, um, so here NP is just going to be the residue of delta restricted, nabla restricted to this disk. It'll be the residue of P of Nabla restricted to this disk. So you'll get this local uh, residue map and it acts on the fiber of the Deline's canonical extension at that point and it preserves the weight filtration. And so we require, so this is the fancy condition, the technical condition, but it's extremely useful and powerful. So we require that this NP, this local monodromy logarithm have a relative weight filtration. All right, so I guess I wrote this here. So this is a nilpotent operator operating on the fiber of Deline's canonical extension over this point. So Deline's canonical extension is a bundle over the whole thing. It's got a fiber over P. And now, so let me explain what a relative weight filtration is. So, the abstract setting is we have a vector space over a field of characteristic zero with a nilpotent endomorphism. So for example, here, there's gonna be a second piece of data, which is this filtration. But before I get to that, uh, recall that if you just have a nilpotent endomorphism of V, N has a weight filtration. So this is a, an increasing filtration. So you'll have WK contained in WK plus one and so on. And this monodromy weight filtration of N or this weight filtration of N is characterized by two properties. One is that N lowers weights by two. And the second one is that N to the K takes the Kth graded quotient into the minus Kth graded quotient. So N lowers weights by two, and here N to the K lowers weights by two K. And it's easy to use Jordan form to prove that these things exist, this filtration exists, and it's unique. So this is unique. And it's basically just Jordan canonical form. All right, so now we're in the situation where in addition to just having a nilpotent endomorphism, we also have a weight filtration. So, so we're assuming now, yeah, before I get to that, if we sort of think of V as having weight M, we can shift this monodromy weight filtration just formally so that it has, and I'll call this new filtration M for M for monodromy filtration. And we want that N of MK is, in MK minus two, but now we want this filtration to be centered instead of at zero at M. So N to the K will go from graded M plus, M plus K to graded M minus K. All right, so that's exactly what you're all familiar with in the case of limits of Hodge structures. This would be the monodromy weight filtration associated to a variation of Hodge structure of weight M. But now here, uh, so here's the definition. 
the situation is we have a nilpotent endomorphism of a finite dimensional vector space with a increasing filtration. The nilpotent endomorphism has to preserve W. And we're going to say that a filtration M is a relative weight filtration of this nilpotent endomorphism acting on a filtered vector space if this condition is satisfied, n lowers m by two. But on each w graded quotient, you want m to cut out the shifted weight filtration. Right? So this is not. It's not this guy that's centered at zero. It's the guy that is centered at M, right? So So uh, that's it. And if it exists, it's unique. So it's unique if it exists. But I should point out as for generic nilpotent endomorphisms of a felt, filtered vector space, it does not exist. So unlike the pure case where you always have a monodromy weight filtration, in the mixed case, it is a highly non-trivial restriction. And that's why this is a very important condition. <clears throat> it, I should say here, I believe it's in, I believe, the first place it appeared was in V2. I think I found it in there, but there's Steenbrink Zucker. I should say, by the way, that this definition of variations of mixed Hodge structure is due to Steenbrink Zucker with additions by other people like Casuara. But um, so they wrote down this condition where the base was a curve. All right, so let me give you an example of where it doesn't exist. And you can think of, um, well, when we get to the relevant theorem, you can think of this condition as being a restriction on the local topology of degenerations of either singular varieties or non-smooth varieties or homotopy groups, whatever. So here's the example. So my vector space is gonna be three-dimensional. It's gonna have a weight filtration so it's going to have, so um, dim V is equal to three. So um, GRW zero is isomorphic to Q. Here it is up here. So the weight filtration is going this way and this should be W minus one, by the way, yeah. Um, G R W minus one is isomorphic to Q squared. And you could think of this as being something like H one of an elliptic curve. And my nilpotent endomorphism, um, it's got to preserve W. So on the bottom piece, I'm just going to make it this map here. So this will be just an isomorphism. And now, so this part here has, this has got to be just on the lower part. The M filtration has got to be the standard monodromy weight filtration of this guy centered at minus one. So that's that. So we already know what M is down here. Now, if N happened to take this Q into that Q, then there's no relative weight filtration because this thing, where for, this guy has to be in graded M zero. The, the M filtration on this graded quotient is just centered at zero, it's trivial. And if N happened to take this Q into that Q, there's no relative weight filtration. The relative weight filter, the only way you can get a relative weight filtration is if N takes this Q into this Q of one, right? So, um, it's really easy to write down examples where the 
relative weight filtration does not exist. All right, so, and now we still haven't finished the definition of a variation. Um, so what we require is that for each P in the divisor, so we're back to the situation where we have our, um, think of this here, here's our P here. We put a little analytic arc here. We've got our fiber of the lens canonical extension with its Hodge filtration, but now it has this relative weight filtration. So this is the relative weight filtration. We require it to exist. So now we're using it. So this is a mixed Hodge structure and I have to tell you what the Q structure is. And the Q structure I'm going to call V DDT is just the limits of flat rational sections. So V, these in general will be multi-valued, but if I take my um, tangent vector here, so the parameter in that disk is T, and this will be DDT is my vector here. I can take some sort of angular sector around it, which is, um, simply connect, it'll be simply connected. And now I can look at flat sections of VQ in this section. And I take the limits as T goes to zero of T to the minus this monodromy logarithm times these flat rational sections. And the theory of ODEs with regular singular points will tell you that this is a Q form of this vector space. So the Q form is gonna depend on the DDT. So in other talks, people did things the other way around. They, they view the sort of rational structures being constant and the complex thing is, you know, is the Hodge filtration is moving around. For topological and geometric reasons, I like to think of this guy fixed. It's the fiber of the canonical extension and the rational structure is moving as I move this tangent vector. And I should say, this mixed Hodge structure, it depends only on T to first order. So it depends only on this tangent vector in this picture. It does not depend on the disk or its parameterization. It only depends on DDT. And that's another important um, fact, but that goes, that's way back in Schmidt's original paper on variations of Hodge structure. All right, so, um, so the, this would all be useless if there were no limits of mixed Hodge structures didn't exist or variations of mixed Hodge structure. And so there's a theorem and it says that if you have a topologically locally trivial family of varieties, they could be singular, they could be non-compact. All you require is that they be topologically locally trivial. Then you can take these push forwards here. So the local systems of HK with rational coefficients, and this will underline an admissible variation of mixed Hodge structure over X in the following cases. If the fibers of F are smooth, right? So if they're smooth and compact, that's Schmidt. If they're just smooth, that's steenbrink Zucker. So they proved that sometime in the 80s. If F is general, it was proved by Guillen, Poeta, and Navarro Asnar around the same time. That's some spring lecture notes in math. And a lot of it follows again from Mariko Saito's work on Hodge modules and mixed Hodge modules. But anyway, it's, it's general. And in addition, I'll be vague, but if I have, um, again, a topologically locally trivial family of varieties, and I have two sections, um, then I have a local system of fundamental groupoids. So on each fiber, I, so I've got a, a family of varieties here that's locally topologically trivial, and I have two sections, say A and B, and on any fiber over X, I can take the fiber yx and I, I can look at paths from this point to that point that are in the fiber. And now 
Um, we could look at various completions of this path torso, and I'll discuss those later on, but their coordinate rings will form a direct limit of variations of, of, of yeah. <clears throat> they will be end objects in the category of admissible variations. So in other words, these variations, yeah, each fiber has a mixed hot structure and these mixed hot structures behave very well when you go to infinity. So anyway, so the next thing I want to discuss is why do we care about, why might you care about admissible variations of mixed hot structure. So one example that's occurred in various talks is the following. Um, X may be the moduli space or moduli stack of smooth projective varieties of a certain kind. For example, hypersurfaces of some degree in projective space. And X bar may be some natural compactification where the divisor at infinity is a divisor with normal crossings. I should add, strictly speaking, we don't need this condition that the, what's at infinity is a divisor with normal crossings because you can always, if you had a situation where your X, you know, the part you care about is smooth, but you know, infinity could have complicated singularities and you want to understand something at infinity, you can always put a little analytic arc through it and or, or put an algebraic curve through it and compute the restrict the variation to that curve and compute a limit mixed hot structure. You can always do that. So strictly speaking, you don't need to have X bar smooth and you don't need it to be um, the complement to be a device with normal crossings. But anyway, I'll, I'll assume we're in the normal crossings case, and maybe we have a normal vector field along an open stratum of the boundary. And it could be just locally defined. And even if we don't have it, we can do something else. So we might have a pure variation of hot structure, like the variation of HKs of the varieties we care about, of the universal family of varieties over this moduli space. And then we'll get an admissible variate. Um, yeah, I should just, this is just a polarized variation of hot structure in general. <clears throat> oh yeah, sorry. We've got our variation here, but we can take the limit mixed hot structures at everywhere along this boundary component. So Colleen did something like that. And so this will be an admissible variation. It depends on the normal vector field. If you don't like this, instead, we could get a, nil, a family of nilpotent orbits, and that nilpotent orbit would live on all the normal, would live on the normal bundle of this stratum. Right? We would get a variation. So for every tangent vector here in the normal bundle, we would get a limit mixed hot structure. And now um, I should have mentioned previously that I, I didn't do it, but in, if you have a limit mixed hot structure, NP takes the, this limit into this limit is a morphism of type minus one. In other words, it's a morphism when you twist by Q of one. Right, so um, this is a morphism. So fiber by fiber, if you want, you can take invariance or co-invariance of N and get a variation just over D itself. And Colleen did something like that. All right, so now that you've agreed that variations of mixed hot structure are interesting, um, I guess you wouldn't be here if you didn't think they were. So um, you might be interested in tools for trying to understand them. So for me, the most basic tool is the theorem of the fixed path. In the pure case, it's due to Schmidt. In the mixed case, it's due to Steenbrink and Zucker, and probably at least in the geometric case and 
maybe to get the most general case, you have to go to Saito. But anyway, the key point is, is that if you have an admissible variation of mixed hot structure over X, then the invariants have a natural mixed hot structure. And so the invariants are just the vectors that are invariant on the monodromy. So there's a natural map to any fiber. And for every fiber, this inclusion is a morphism. So- Excuse me. I'm sorry, sorry I cannot see the last pass. Could you, yeah, thank you. Yeah, you feel free to yell at me if I not well centered here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, so, so the invariants have a mixed hot structure for every, so that doesn't depend on any point. And at each point, this inclusion is a morphism. So the important thing for me that I like to think of it is what I call rigidity. So this is a corollary. And it says, if you have two variations over X and you have some point where the fibers have the same mixed hot structure. And if the monodromy representations are the same. So this isomorphism here is not arbitrary. It would be the one corresponding to this isomorphism of fibers. Then the two variations are the same. They're isomorphic. So, you know, in the vernacular, it's just saying a variation is determined by one fiber and its global monodromy. And so this is a useful thing because we can ask how can we recover a variation from one fiber and its monodromy? And I should, yeah, there's an interesting point here and we're gonna see an example. Sometimes all you need to know is that they have the same graded quotients and the same monodromy. So basically some, in some cases, Two variations are isomorphic if they have the same monodromy. Clearly, you could take twist them, but let's ignore that. So, if the, um, yeah, so a weak version of one. So, what I want to discuss is how you can reconstruct a variation from knowing the mixed hot structure on one fiber and the monodromy. I, I've got to stress you've got to start with a variation. You can't just take some mixed hard structure and some representation and spread it out. Clearly, you can't do that. Um, so for this, we need relative unipotent completion. So Francis already mentioned it in his talk. I will um, review it quickly. This is one of these things that's best to, you, you need to see enough to have, have some understanding of what's happening, but if you, you don't want to get too bogged down in the details too quickly the first time you see it. So the input is a discrete group and a reductive group over Q could be over any field of characteristic zero, but I'm going to, we're looking at Q variation. So I want a Q group here and some Zariski dense representation. So one example that I care a lot about and I think Francis cares a lot about is where gamma is SL2Z. S is SL2 is an algebraic group over Q. It's certainly reductive, it's semi simple. And um, the monodromy representation or rho is just going to be the inclusion. That certainly is a risky dense. And Another example would be where we take um, we take X as smooth variety as above, and we've got some polarized variation of hot structure, or some direct sum of them, some semi-simple variation of mixed hot structure. And we're going to take S to be the Zariski closure of the monodromy. And so it's well known this is a reductive group. And my final example is where gamma's disc any discrete group and S is trivial. So this case is going to correspond to unipotent completion. Let's see, am I 
Okay, so the relative, usually leave out the unipotent, the relative completion of gamma with respect to this data or with respect to rho, it's an affine Q group. So um, it's not an affine algebraic group. The difference, the distinction here is an affine group is algebraic if its coordinate ring is finitely generated. So typically these coordinate rings will not be finitely generated. And so this means it's easy to prove in characteristic zero that every affine group is the inverse limit of affine algebraic groups. So this will be a pro-algebraic group. It'll be an inverse limit of algebraic groups. And it's going to be an extension of your original group, your original reductive group by a pro-unipotent group. The so pro-unipotent means inverse limit of unipotent groups. And there is also a Zariski dense homomorphism from gamma into GQ that lifts rho. And what this means is that you've got this homomorphism from G to S. This will map into SQ. Sorry, but could, yeah. you, could you repeat the paper again? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Just uh, yell at me when I go, when I, the page is too high. Okay. So this homomorphism will, um, yeah, this one lifts rho. And you should just think of this as the most general homomorphism of, of this kind that's risky dense and lifts rho. It's the most general group that you can find. And um, yeah, there it is. It's the most general such G. And it's characterized by a universal mapping problem. Maybe I'll write that down. So what would the universal mapping property be? I'll, I'll omit rational points. But suppose I had some group that's an extension. So this is some affine group that's an extension of S by U. So it might be the monodromy of your variation. There's a risky closure of the monodromy representation of your um, unipotent variation. And suppose you have a homomorphism into it, which lifts rho. Then there's going to be a homomorphism from the universal guy here. This will be rho hat. So the homomorphism you have from gamma into the rational points of this group is going to factor through the universal guy. There'll be a unique way to factor this here by some, we'll call it phi twiddle. Right, so this guy induces this guy here. <clears throat> and if you like, G is just going to be the inverse limit of over all such representations phi that are the risky dense. I'll call that. Right. If you took the inverse limit of all of these pictures, where this guy is a risky dense, you would obtain this guy here. So it sounds sort of abstract, but there are concrete tools for understanding them, and you can write them down explicitly in good situations. All right, so um, I just gave you the naive constructions in an inverse limit. You can also use Tanakian machinery, as Francis explained, to construct it. For example, in the unipotent case, you would just take the category of unipotent representations of gamma. It's Tanakian. You take its Tanakian fundamental group, and that's the unipotent completion. All right, so there's also a Durham theory. So in the case when gamma is the fundamental group of a smooth manifold or a smooth variety, and S is the Zariski closure of the monodromy representation of some 
local system over your X. Right. So um, I'm not going to explain this here, but I'll say that the coordinate ring, yeah, we can also complete path forces. Right? I didn't mention that, but not only can, can we complete fundamental groups, we can complete relatively complete path forces, paths from A to B in our X. And its coordinate ring will be consist of closed iterated integrals of one forms with values in the um, set of local systems that are generated by H by taking tensor products and sub quotients. So for example, if we were looking at local systems, say over um, AG or the moduli space of elliptic curves, we would look at all the iterated integrals of one forms on the moduli space to take values in local systems corresponding to irreducible representations of the symplectic group. And if you're doing unipotent completion, that's when H is trivial, um, you would look at the usual iterated line integrals of Chen. And if you look at F, if you're looking at the moduli space of elliptic curves and your group is SL2Z, you're looking at iterated integrals of modular forms. And at least in the holomorphic case, um, this is what Menin called iterated Shimura integrals. So this is, and Francis Brown is also, um, I mean, he's got a big project to try to understand the periods of these guys. It's called, uh, multiple modular values. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> so the basic theorem that I alluded to before is that if H is a polarized variation of hot structure over X, and this is the corresponding relative completion of paths in X from A to B, then the first statement is that, that its coordinate ring has a natural mixed hot structure. I should say it's a natural end mixed hot structure. In general, it's infinite dimensional. So it'd be a direct limit of finite dimensional mixed hot structures. The maps corresponding to multiplication of paths. So if you looked at paths from A to B, and B to C, you get a map from GAB cross GBC into GAC, so that on coordinate rings, the map goes the other way. This is a morphism of mixed hot structures. And if you look at all of these where you vary A and B, you get an admissible variation of mixed hot structure over the product. So Steve Zook and I consider this sort of 30, Wow, 35 years ago in the unipotent case, but the whole thing works in the general case. So that's an admissible variation. And in a sense, it's the most general admissible variation where the graded quotients are constructed out of H, as I'll, I'll explain now. So this is going to be the reconstruction result. If you look at all variations whose graded quotients are built out of sub quotients of tensor powers of H, maybe tensored with a trivial hot structure, sorry, with, with a constant hot structure, then um, somehow they're all built up out of this guy. And how? Yeah, so the category of variations of mixed hot structure whose weight graders lie in the category of variations generated by your pure guy. So tensor products and uh, yeah, generate basically given by 
sub quotients of tensor powers of this guy and also tensor products with constant mixed Hodge structures is equivalent to the category of Hodge representations of GAA. So this guy here is the relative completion of pi one XA, if you like, with respect to the monodromy of H. And for each such variation, the map, so the, there's an action here of, I always get tied in a knot over left and right because different people use different conventions. But if we multiply paths in the topologist way, there'll be a map from VA cross GAB into VB. This corresponds to a map going this way the side flips here. This has a mixed hot structure. This fiber has a mixed hot structure. This coordinate ring has a mixed hot structure. And this is a morphism. Right? So this is, um, so it's, for example, if you take A and B to be equal, it's saying the monodromy representation is a morphism of mixed hot structures. And so, and in fact, I didn't write it down here. If you take A equals B, the category, yeah, here it is up here. The category of variations of mixed Hodge structure whose weight graded here is equivalent to the category of Hodge representations of this guy. That means that's equivalent to saying this guy is a morphism when A is equal to B. All right, so, and here's the reconstruction result. So I asked before, how can you um, reconstruct a variation out of one fiber and the monodromy representation? Well, this is it here. If you know VB and you know the monodromy action, this is telling you that you can work out VA because this map is always injected. And so if you just let A vary, it's telling you that the coaction here from V into this variation, this is a variation here where we look at the completion of the path torso and vary the initial point. That's a variation. This is a constant mixed hard structure. And so, this is something universal. It's periods. Its coordinate ring is built up out of iterated integrals. And this is the guy you first thought of, the fiber over your base point. And this is telling you that all the periods everywhere are built up out of the periods of the fiber over your base point. And they're altered by basically matrices whose entries are iterated integrals of differential forms with values in just variations constructed out of your original H. And so this is somehow why iterated integrals appear in this story so much. All right, so I want to quickly give you an arithmetic consideration. So, um, A lot of, you know, I'm, I know quite a bit about moduli of curves, but I don't know about moduli problems in general. But my impression is that if you have a moduli space, typically moduli spaces are defined over very small rings. So for example, the moduli spaces of curves are always defined over Z and they're smooth when they're reduced mod P for all P. So, in general, we, I assume that moduli spaces have models over some ring of integers in a number field, and so does their completion. And that these models, the whole story will have good reduction outside some, fi some finite set of primes. And also, if we take a tangent vector V here of the boundary, that is, defined over this ring of integers and is non-zero at all primes in this ring of integers, then what you would expect is the limit of any 
the, the standard canonical variations here you would get in this moduli problem at this point would be Hodge realizations of motives over this unramified over this ring of integers. Uh, and that's kind of, sorry. Could and you, so, ah, you went up here. Thank you. I can take pictures of all these slides and give you a PDF or something, but right. So the point is, if we go back to this slide here to understand the variation, you need to understand the monodromy, you need to understand one fiber. And in this story here, this B can be tangential, can be a tangent vector. So I'm trying to say, how can you find a fiber where you can say what the periods are? And I'm saying if everything, if it, if it has some sort of arithmetic significance, then you can at least reduce the set of periods that you expect to find in this limit mixed odd structure. And I wanna finally, if I get to it, give examples of where that might be the case. So in this case, you would expect that this guy here is the Hodge realization for appropriate age of a motive over O of K unramified outside of S. Yeah, so for the fundamental group and for the fiber of the local system. <clears throat> so here's an example. If we look at, this is a, an example that Francis and I care a lot about and spend a lot of time thinking about is that X would be M11 over Z. And um, this, this thing's a stack over Z. V is DD cube. And I claim this tangent vector is integrally defined. That follows from the standard integral model of the Tate curve. And it's non zero all P because the discriminant of the Tate curve is equal to something like Q times the product of one minus Q to the N to the 24th. And that, and this is in Z Q. And you can, if you reduce the Tate curve mod P, it's just this thing mod P. And if you remind it, if you take it mod Q squared, which is taking this tangent vector, it's always non-zero because it's just Q mod Q squared. It's non-zero for all P. So this is an exact, this is non-zero all P. So therefore you would expect, and we're gonna take H to be the standard rank two local system, the, the canonical variation that occurs in the SL2 orbit theorem. It's the most canonical thing on the planet. All right, so we, with that in mind, we're gonna look at some examples. Again, X is M11. Again, we're gonna think of it as an analytic orbital fold now. We're gonna do Hodge theory, but we're gonna sort of, we're going to take these base point, this base point here, because it's got arithmetic significance. So the periods of our variations at this tangent vector should be motives unramified over Z or periods of them. And so therefore, they should be subject to all sorts of conjectures. And again, this is, I should say, I don't wanna to take too much credit here. This is Francis's program or related to it, his program of multiple modular values and mixed modular motives. So it's trying to do for modular motives, modular forms, what the theory of multi Zavis does to uh, mixed tape motives. All right, so we've got X is M11. We've got our universal elliptic curve. We've got our local system H, rank two. X is the orbifold quotient of the upper half plane. We can include, it's actually not an inclusion, but we can take D star, the puncture disk maps into here. Parameters Q equals E to the two pi I tau. <clears throat> and we're going to, H is going to be the canonical extension of H tends to O to M11. We're going to be a little bit careful about what this means here because, you know, this is, this is a stack that um, came up in Nick's talk. 
but there's various ways to handle this. This H is an extension of F1 by graded or graded F0 by F1. Um, the kernel here is the standard line bundle with factor of automorphic C tau plus D, and that's the one module sections of its M power are just um, modular forms of weight M. And I should say here, this guy splits. You can see this directly. So this is really a direct sum of L and L inverse. This follows because it'd be the same as an extension of O by L squared. And that's the same as a modular form of weight two. So that's a quick and dirty proof. You can write down the explicit splitting of it. Um, all right, so let's try to understand just simple extensions of Q by some power of H tensored with some constant hot structure. And I'm going to assume that M is positive because um, if M is zero, well, it, it's easily handled. <clears throat> so the first theorem, and this is really a special case of a more general theorem, says that extensions in the category of admissible variations over M11 is the same as the Deline cohomology of M11 with these twisted coefficients. And you just define Deline cohomology with coefficients in a variation in the obvious way. I've got, it's in a paper I wrote um, with a very bad title. Yeah, maybe I should write it down. I, I've got a, a paper called something like Deline Valence and Cohomology of Affine Groups. And I think it's in, yeah, I, I don't know where it is, but it's published somewhere. Anyway, but we have this guy here. And what this does is it leads us to a short exact sequence, standard short exact sequence for Deline cohomology. The kernel is X1 of Q by the cohomology in the degree one lower. But we're assuming that M, M here is positive. So this guy H0 is zero. There are no invariants because this is an irreducible representation of SL2. So there are no invariants. And gamma here just means Hodge classes, HOM from the trivial Hodge structure into here. So this guy has to be an isomorphism. And so let's try to understand what this guy is here. So I think various things get called Eichler Shimura, but one thing I call Eichler Shimura says that H1 of M11 with coefficients in this variation. So this variation has weight M. It's going to be the cuspidal cohomology, uh, this part here, and this part here will have weight M plus one. And it's the same as the intersection homology. And then it has another part here, this corresponds to, it's spanned by the Eisenstein series. Uh, I'll write this down on the next slide. But so this part here, this part has weight uh, 2M plus two. So you get two weights here, M plus one, which is the cuspidal part, and twice that, which is the part coming from Eisenstein series. And um, all right, so, <clears throat> whoops. Yes, so the corollary here is that this, um, the only way you can get something in here is if A is either Q of M plus one, in which case you get something corresponding to the Eisenstein series, or A is a simple sum, direct sum, or something that contains a simple factor of this Hodge structure here. And it's known that those simple Hodge structures correspond to Hecker eigencusp forms. So um, 
this guy vanishes except when A is this guy here. So this is the Eisenstein case. And or A, A, I should say, contains a simple factor of this hot structure here, or it's dual, I, I should say. And so there, this just leads us to looking at two basic examples, either an extension of Q by this variation, and that's going to correspond to the, hot, uh, the Eisenstein series of weight 2n plus 2, or this one here, which corresponds f as a, a Hecker eigenform. of weight, uh, yeah, sorry, I should just put M plus two here. I should have mentioned over here that this thing will vanish when M is odd. For SL2C, you only get cohomology when M is even. So um, M of weight M plus two. And it's to be understood that M here is even. And so that's the dual of the hot structure of a Hecker eigen cusp form. So I'm going to try to write these down. I've got a few minutes. So, and I just want to write down the limit at DDQ to illustrate this fact that the periods of these things have arithmetic significance. And the way you spread out the limit mixed hot structure is by integrating the modular form in the upper half plane. So I should point out that if you look at our local system here, what's the limit mixed hot structure? It's, this is in fact a Z variation. And in the limit, this guy degenerates to a Z plus, an, sorry, an extension of Z by Z of one. And X to one Z by Z of one is C star. And lambda in C star corresponds to lambda times DDQ. So the two arithmetic tangent vectors in here are plus and minus D, DQ correspond to plus or minus one in this group. If I took lambda equals minus one, I'd get this extension of order two. And if I take lambda equal to plus one, this extension is split even over Z. All right, so, but we're working rationally. So HDDQ, the limit of this two dimensional hot structure is Q plus Q of, I should, Q of minus one here. Okay, I, I do something here. I identify H upper one with H lower one by Poincare duality. And I'm doing something nasty here. A, Now here's our, if I look at his tau one and so on, A is this guy here, this is B and W is equal to minus B plus tau A. And this is the Poincare dual of DZ. DZ here takes the value one on A, and tau on B. And so DZ is equal to um, A check plus tau B check, but that's the same as um, minus B plus tau A if you identify everything using Poincare duality. Okay, so and this is the right, this is the a basis of the Deline framing of the canonical extension. We can't use B because it's multi-valued in the Q-disc, but both of these guys are single-valued in the Q-disc. And so the symmetric powers of this are, yeah, I think I have to twist by N here. But anyway, it splits as a direct sum of Tate guys going from Z Q of zero to Q of minus M. I think I get it right just back here. So um, let's construct these two guys here. 
The first case is the Eisenstein case. I'll do these very quickly. Um, you can just write down this connection form here, the Eisenstein series times W to the N. That's just the, like I say, the Poincaré dual of BZ times DQ over Q. And we take the local, the vector bundle is just going to be the direct sum as a holomorphic vector bundle of this symmetric power of H and this, with this connection, it's flat. And it has obvious Hodgkin weight filtrations. But what about a Q structure? So this one, this form defines a one co-cycle phi on SL2Z. And I, one thing I learned from Francis Brown is that, well, we know this cohomology class of this here, because of the action of the Hecker algebra, we know it's a rational cohomology class. And, but the trouble is we don't, you know, we, we want to find the rational structure on this variation. And I claim this a unique rational structure that makes it a variation. This follows, this is an example of this kind of rigidity that I mentioned before where all we need to know is the monodromy. And so the trick here is we have to adjust the co-cycle of C by a co-boundary to make it a rational co-cycle. But when you do that, you, you discover the period of this variation. Let's see if I, I've got it on the next slide. Yeah, here's the Q of zero. The only possible extension you can get here, if you play with the relative weight filtration, all these other extensions have got to vanish and you get an extension of Q by Q of M plus one and its period is essentially Zeta of M plus one. So if you believe what I said about the arithmetic properties of periods, you would expect this to be a period of a mixed tape, of a mixed tape motive over Z, unramified over Z. So it had to be a Zeta value. And like I said, you can easily argue using the relative weight filtration, all the other guys are going to vanish. So this one would be a non-zero, should be a rational multiple of this guy. And indeed it is. And I think the period's n factorial over two times this, maybe. All right, and so let me, I'm over time, but let me just quickly do the cuspidal case because it's extremely interesting. So in this case, And I'm only going to do it for F equals delta equals cusp form of weight 12. And I'll do it extremely quickly because this has a different property. In this case, this has weight 10. VF has weight 11. So this has weight minus 11. So this guy here has weight minus one. So this is an extension of Q by something of weight minus one. I don't know where this occurs in geometry. So we look at this guy here and it is not split as a holomorphic vector bundle. So in the Eisenstein series case, this, the Deligne's canonical extension split at split, I never know, split, splat, splat, splat as a holomorphic vector bundle. Here it does not. So I'm gonna write, We've got the Peterson inner product, so we can identify V dual with V twisted by 11. And as a C infinity vector bundle, this guy is the direct sum of just the trivial bundle plus this guy here. You can write down a flat connection on it. And nabla zero just means the connection on H, the standard connection. And there's this part of it, then you add this one form. So V is a hot structure of type 11, zero and a zero 11. This is the form corresponding to Delta. So Omega Delta is just Delta of Q times Omega to the 10 times DQ over Q. It's a well-defined one form and that's its complex conjugate. This is the dual basis 
of the jewel. And so this guy here represents the identity in harm VV or V tensor V dual. And so this guy is rational. That's an important fact. And so how do we get the holomorphic structure on this bundle? Well, we write NABLA as D prime plus D double prime, where this is this part's of type one zero, and this is the zero one part of the connection. So the zero one part's D bar plus this guy here, and it's square is zero. So the holomorphic structure on this bundle is just locally given by sections which are killed by D double prime. So that's how you get the holomorphic structure on the bundle. And what's the limit mixed hot structure? Well, the weight zero part is this, and this is the weight, this has got weight zero, weight minus one. This part here is just V of one up to V of 11. And I've got to say that if we just believe in arithmetic, Arithmetic tells us that sh this should split. All these conjectures in number theory because X of Q by VD should vanish for all D less than the weight of the modular form. So these should all vanish, but you can actually prove that. I won't do it, but it's basically using the fact that this form here represents the identity. So the co-cycle corresponding to this one form is rational. So I'll stop there. So this guy splits at infinity, but you could guess that from, if you believe in all of these conjectures in number theory that tell you about motivic extensions of say Q by some twist of V, then this is exactly what you would expect. So I'll stop here. Sorry for going over time. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any question or comment? Oh, I'll uh, ask a little one. Dick, very nice talk. Thank you. And are there, I mean, this is something I don't know that I know almost nothing about, but I seem to recall in the Zeta case, uh, just the, uh, you know, your extensions of mm -hmm. um, hard tape things that you get arithmetic consequences about linear independence of values of zeta or things of that sort. Does this happen in the case of uh, the modular forms also? I, I'm not the person to ask. The person to ask is Francis. He's still there yet. So um, yeah, I mean, I think in the case of Ms. Francis, you can go ahead. Go ahead. I thought you were um, passing the question to me, but I'd much rather that you answer it since you're giving the talk. No, but you should answer it. Um, um, well, I, I'm not sure I completely um, understand the the, um, the the sense of the question, but but yes, the the idea is 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 definitely that we want to. Um, uh, sort of mimic all the things that you can show for um, mixed tape motives and multiple zeta values and p1 minus three points and carry that across to the, the modular setting. Um, so, but a lot of the, the the numbers and the structures involved are new. Um, but but you're right. Yes, that one, one of the the applications of um, the, the the motivic point of view on, on p1 minus three points is that it predicts a vast quantity of relations between periods and, and we expect exactly the same thing to happen here. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Other, other questions or comments? Okay, if not, yeah, let's thanks to Professor Heng for his beautiful talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we will resume at 1 p.m. So, yeah. And uh, so, see you, see you at the time. Thank you very much. <laughs>